number 8547 and 109-059, Stephen Cresto and Teresa Cresto v. Mark, excuse me, Mary Kay Kaler Cresto. Did I get the name correct? Yes. Very good. Thank you, Council. Your Honor, may I please court? Um, Michael Arong on behalf of Stephen Cresto and Teresa Jones. They are the uh, appellees, cross appellants in this matter. And uh, I would uh, ask the court reserve five minutes of rebuttal time for me. Five minutes is granted. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, My clients in this matter, uh, uh, Stephen Cresto and Teresa Jones, are two of the children of the decedent in this case, uh, Francis Cresto, and uh, two of the four remainder beneficiaries of the long-standing estate plan of Francis Cresto. In 2008, without the knowledge of my clients, uh, the estate plan of Francis Cresto was dramatically altered. Uh, to effectively disinherit them, and that uh, fact was unknown to them until after their father's death. Uh, that resulted in, uh, in my clients filing an undue influence uh, claim in the District Court of Johnson County. That matter proceeded to trial, a uh, bench trial before Judge Vano. Um, my clients were the successful litigants, and Judge Vano uh, found the uh, found the documents that were executed in 2008 to be null and void as a result of undue influence. The matter was then appealed, the Court of Appeals reversed. Who's undue influence? Um, undue influence by, on behalf of the surviving spouse, done by a, uh, an interested party, the drafter of the documents, as the court knows, as, as a, an attorney in Indiana who had a, a, a relationship with uh, one of the daughters of of, uh, uh, of, um, of of the surviving spouse. So the drafter was the interested party. The beneficiary of the undue influence was Kathleen Presto. Now, how those two work together and 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 and. Well, but did your pleadings, were they broad enough to allege that Ms. Hackett, the Scribner, was acting as an agent on behalf of the spouse, Kathleen? Uh, uh, and that's well, basically what Judge Vano said. I mean, he, he said that's... that's Right. Why? Why he found where he found the influence was from Ms. Hackett on behalf of uh, Kathleen. Yeah, we, uh, Hackett, uh, 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 Ms. Hackett, acting on behalf of Kathleen Presto was the one who drafted the documents. Um, our pleadings allege that the documents were null and void by by the result of undue influence. The as with any case, when you're filing a case as the petitioner. The how the facts develop, uh, well, you know that that took the discovery phase of the case to determine how you know who, where eventually the undue influence occurred. That that's the classic problem with undue influence cases is that the uh, that the activity is not to use the old phrase it is not announced from the rooftops. It has to be discovered and and as often has to be proved by circumstantial evidence because there's not the classic smoking gun of undue influence. So how it actually transpired, what conversations were had, what, there are things we don't know about, but yes, the drafter of the document was, uh, uh, and, and, and the court found it was the combination, I think, of the surviving spouse and the drafting attorney. But do, do you, do you have any evidence of that other than just it must have been? Because we have evidence to the contrary where Miss Hackett had said, uh, I think in correspondence, that she was not representing Kathleen, that she was representing Francis. Right. Well, we have emails that went from Kathleen Presto to Pat Hackett uh, uh, saying this, these are the terms of, of how the trust should read. 
Now there was conflicting, you know, there was some testimony about, well, that was done at the, at the direction of her husband, but it, it very clearly, the husband did not have an email account. It went from, it went from, uh, Kathleen Presto and I, she was there at, uh, either on the telephone or the one sending the emails uh, that, you know, that ultimately resulted in the document. The, the steps we have to go through as I see it, and I want you to correct me if you see that this plays out differently. First, we have to determine whether there was uh, substantial competent evidence to support the finding of suspicious circumstances. And if that's uh, uh, true, then the next step is whether that uh, presumption was rebutted. I would agree, Your Honor. Yes. Okay. Yes. And um, uh, assuming uh, suspicious circumstances, why wasn't there a rebuttal in this case? What, at the trial court, why wasn't there a rebuttal part of the case? Because, and this is often happens with these undue influence cases, there's a common core of witnesses and uh, there was an agreement among counsel that uh, whatever witness was called would be examined by both parties uh, and the cross could exceed the scope of the direct because both parties were using them. Um, as the plaintiff, we uh, we presented our, our all all of our evidence and at the close of our case we asked for a ruling on the presumption the court uh, made that ruling uh, the defense didn't have any counter evidence to put on so the court so the case then proceeded to closing arguments but uh, I, I have observed it done otherwise where the issue of the uh, the ruling on the rebuttal happens with other evidence I'm sorry the issue of the uh, the arising of the presumption is determined, and then other evidence is presented by the defendant if uh, if the uh, if the burden is, happens to have uh, occurred. That just didn't happen in this case. The I think the real issue before this court is not only what you said, but that the trial court made rulings, uh, specific factual rulings, rulings on credibility, rulings on evidence. And what happened here is the court of, court of Appeals very clearly usurped the authority of the trial court and made rulings on credibility of witnesses that is frankly not allowed in this court or, or in, in, in the appellate courts in Kansas or the appellate courts anywhere in this country. Was, was uh, capacity of Francis ever a question at the time he entered into the planning documents? It was prepared initially... Prepared by uh, Hackett. It was initially pled that there may be issues about about his overall health after after obtaining medical records we did not uh, we dropped the count on lack of capacity what but we but we continued you dropped that count right That's yeah what I recall. yeah we and and then uh, Hackett then said you ought to have independent counsel review this did, did that occur to no, that Actually, how, how did Mr. Logan get involved? Then? Well, Mr. Logan got involved, and this is a key factor, is that uh, Pat Hackett is an attorney only licensed to practice law in the state of Indiana. Well, there may be other states, but she's not licensed to practice in Kansas. Uh, Mr. Prasto uh, actually resided in Johnson County, and so what she told him is, I will prepare these documents, but you need to have them executed in Kansas they're two fir the, the two law firms were part of a, a national lawyer-to-lawyer -lawyer referral service. And so actually, actually, Mr. Logan was contacted to be the Kansas counsel that would oversee the execution of the documents. He, he was asked specifically at trial, were you the estate planning counsel for Francis Presto? And he said, no. Patricia Hackett in Indiana was the estate planning attorney and, and, and that was also the finding of Judge Vano, is that, is that what Mr. Logan did was he did a courtesy. He understood himself to be doing a courtesy to another lawyer, longtime attorney of Francis Cresto, who had asked for documents to be overseen. 
he extended a courtesy. He did not undertake independent, independent legal advice as to the documents. And that was, those were specific findings of, of Judge Vano. Also consistent with a letter that uh, actually Mr. Logan actually wrote my clients after their father's death. And he said, our office oversaw the execution. I was not privy to the estate planning discussions your father had with her attorney. But, but you, you only get to the uh, lack of independent uh, advice if uh, you buy into the uh, trial court's uh, determination that uh, Judge Logan wasn't credible when he said, I ask uh, Francis whether he understood he was cutting out his kids through this document, and he said, yes, I do. And if that's credible, it, it'd be hard-pressed to say that this gentleman didn't have independent advice, wouldn't you? Well, and I think that's the key issue here, is that the Court of Appeals ruling uh, overturns the credibility finding of Judge Vano, and if that, and that's the but, really but import of this case. I, I understand that, and, and the appellate court shouldn't uh, engage in credibility assessment, but my question to you is that regardless of the reason for employment or whatever, um, that's pretty uh, definitive evidence of independent counsel uh, if that statement and answer were given, isn't it? Well, I think that statement and answer, I think what Judge Vano did on the district court is he took that statement and evidence in context of all the other evidence before him, as he probably should have as a finder of fact. He took it in context of the letter that Judge Van uh, that that uh, Mr. Logan wrote that says, I wasn't privy to the estate planning discussions. He took it in context of... Uh, 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 the testimony at trial by Mr. Logan that he was not the estate planning attorney, and he took it in the context of Logan not having the prior estate planning documents even with him when he reviewed, so he couldn't have been done the things that a proper estate planning attorney giving independent advice could be, which would be to say, here's your prior documents, here's how they're changed, do you understand what we're going on? He didn't even have those. And so he took it in context of that. He took it in context of it only being a half-hour meeting that uh, he had with Mr. Cresto with the beneficiary of the change being their present. So I think Judge Vano took a lot of factors as a, the trier of fact judging credibility is supposed to do. He took all those factors into consideration and saying, well, if I believe Mr. Logan on this and this and this and that he was truthful in writing this letter after he died and truthful in, in uh, that he was not the estate planning attorney and truthful in that he only spent half an hour, it all it just doesn't add up. And that's, that's, what, that's, why we, that's why we have to rely on trial judges to, to make these decisions. If we're going to allow courts of appeals to do it, we're not opening up a can of worms, we're opening up a barrel of worms. Yeah, I think we understand that. I'm going to take you back real quick. I see you're out of time. That You were answering uh, Justice Rosen's question about uh, Francis's capacity. You said that you withdrew the lack of capacity count, but you started to, to say something further. Uh, are you alleging that that had anything to do with him being amenable to influence? Uh, I, I noticed that he was diagnosed with dementia the, the following year. Uh, were, did you make any allegation that his state of mind was such that he was more susceptible uh, to influence, given all the testimony about how meticulous, uh, organized individual he had been? We did, and we did it in the context of the, the, the rushed nature of these documents. He had gotten a fairly profound diagnosis of uh, yeah. prostate cancer that was going to, that was actually very grim, and he had had a number of discussions that, with my clients about that, that. That would be more compelling if he hadn't contacted Ms. Hackett some months earlier to, to do it. Now, that was the impotence for his calling up and say, hey, I, I want them done now. Well, I mean, that was, that was 
some of the testimony that that he had been talking earlier about some changes, but the rushed the rush documents and the these need to be signed in two days all happened in the context of him getting this very grim cancer diagnosis. And so what are, and so to answer your question, that's an allegation. It's not that he didn't have capacity as in dementia. It's that he was in an agitated, depressed, anxious state. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. May it please the court, uh, James Oliver on behalf of the appellant, Kathleen Cresto. But on top of that, the important thing is the focus of this case is on Francis Cresto and his right to make a will. And the definition of undue influence is this. To be undue influence in the eye of the law, there must be, to sum it up in one word, coercion. It is only when the person who becomes a testator is coerced into doing that which he or she does not desire to do, that it is undue influence. Thus, now, undue Mr. influence. Mr. Oliver, you would agree that our our plan of attack or our uh, analytical path is first to determine whether there's evidence to to support the finding that there were suspicious circumstances. Our case law says that's the first step to overcoming if, the presumption of validity well, well, of the first, will. Well, first, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the first thing you have to do, mm -hmm. the, if well, first thing you have to do is, is prove that you jumped through all the hoops when you executed the will. Right. And then you have the presumption that that document is, is valid. And then the challenge to that on undue influence, the next step is to show suspicious circumstances. Correct. And then if there are sus suspicious circumstances or enough evidence mm -hmm. to support that finding, then it's incumbent... Uh, uh, upon the proponent to come forward with rebutting evidence to rebut that presumption from the suspicious circumstance. Would you agree that's the steps we go through? I would agree that's the steps you go through. I, I would see... give more significance to the formalities because when a guy comes in and signs his will and he's as competent as anybody in this room and there was in fact a stipulation that he was, he did have legal capacity to make a will and not only that he had sound mind which is in the cases noted to be something more than just testamentary capacity because there are cases holding you can have capacity to make a will even if you're feeble of mind and body and it happens and there was no doubt that this was a man who was fully competent and he comes in in front of Two witnesses, a notary public, and a federal judge says, I am doing this as my own free and voluntary act. And if you go back to the cases over and over again, they remind us to remember this is about coercion. And that mere suspicion that somebody had a motive or was in a position to influence, it isn't enough. They say that. And so then you get the suspicious circumstances doctrine using the same word, and it can get confusing because every case... Pretty much says suspicion, isn't it? Are, are you saying there were not suspicious circumstances in this case? No, there were not. And and part of how you think about that is whether well, you have a low threshold of what you think suspicion means. Suspicion well, let, let me throw out some things. We have, uh, and, and this first item is, I think, a common thread that I've seen through throughout uh, all of these cases that I've encountered where you have a second or third wife and children and they have to fight that uh, the uh, long-standing attorney that developed the estate plan that's being thrown out is not utilized for independent advice. And that occurred here. Mr. White was not used for uh, independent advice. I know that there's a reason, or there's a stated reason, but that's a suspicious circumstance. But, well... It, you can rebut it with the reason, but you start with the circumstance. The circumstance that you didn't use the attorney for the existing plan to give independent advice, the fact that the Scrivener did in fact have a relationship with someone who stood to benefit ultimately if the money went to her mother, okay? Mm -hmm. And you have a, a, the circumstance that that person didn't disclose to the independent counsel, uh, Judge Loken, 
that that relationship existed. Now, why aren't those red flags? Uh, they're, they're only suspicious circumstances if you look at the actual circumstances, including all of the circumstances. You indicated there was a good reason why Mr. White was not used in 2004. That's the first time Francis Cresto used Pat Hackett and Jim Logan to help him draft his estate planning documents, and that was almost four years before the one in question. And there was a good reason, I think, you know, Mr. White, I think, had retired by the time they did the 2008 documents, and they'd already established a relationship. There was no change in lawyers between 2004 when he made the will that did leave the property to Francis, or to Kathleen for life, and then to all four children, two of whom are not contesting this 2008 will. So there was no change between 2004 and 2008. He kept the same lawyers, and he knew Jim Logan already. And so I don't understand, the change of lawyer doesn't make a difference. Now, as to what Pat Hackett did, this was tot that's why I want to put the focus on Francis Cresto, and was Francis Cresto coerced? There's no evidence of that anywhere. And the coercion can't be just suggestions. Uh, it, undue influence isn't good influence or bad influence, but coercion. Persuasion and advice don't amount to undue influence so long as that person has the right to freely accept or reject it. And the evidence is undisputed that he was capable. I can't find any cases, really, where somebody who had no susceptibility, who was the man in charge, a lifelong business executive, was found to be under undue influence, literally because of what Judge Bano found. He was lovesick. He loved his wife. And that relationship is not suspect. That's looked at by the law as a laudable thing. So Pat Hackett then, her relationship was a friendship with a daughter of Kathleen Cresto, who in the revised will stood to inherit should her mother outlive Francis Cresto, 2.8% of the estate. She got a seventh got of 20%. You, you got it backwards. The specified amount oh, if, was if... If Francis uh, out, if outlived Kathleen. Outlived Kathleen. Right. Okay. Because it all went to Kathleen, and we don't know... If she what survived her, him. Uh, she may have given it all to Rita or whomever. I mean, we don't know where hers went. Yeah. But potentially, her daughter had a right to inherit it. And the reason yeah. we, one reason we don't know is because Pat Hackett did not represent her. She declined to from the beginning. And what I'm saying is, in trying to describe the relationship, which I did clumsily, is that there is no disqualification here. You, the disqualification of the lawyer results from being personally a benefit, beneficiary or a spouse of a beneficiary. And there was, you know... I, well, there's the, no statutory. The, the relationship was so attenuated here. There's no statutory disqualification, right. and that was found by Judge Vano. Mm -hmm. it, the only the only uh, place that comes into play is whether we're talking about suspicious circumstances in the undue influence, rather than right. the statutory disqualification. And I don't think we have a cross appeal on that on that ruling that that the statutory the statute didn't apply. Okay. So now I get to the question of what do you have to suspect by virtue of Pat Hackett being favorably disposed to Rita Kaler, Kathleen's daughter? Can you draw the inference from that that there was actual undue influence, coercion in the act, in the testamentary act? The evidence is undisputed that he called her in late 2007 in South Bend, Indiana. They never did anything but talk on the phone. In every one of those, conver almost every one of those conversations, she had an associate lawyer on the phone taking contemporaneous notes of what was said. And then she prepares, the will sits there, Francis, Francis he really spent a lot of time working on the contingent charitable bequests. He knew from the first contact he had decided he wanted to leave everything to Kathleen and there were good reasons to do so. The judge found them on the record that there was a wonderful, warm relationship between them, between Francis and the Kaler family, 
And they had a life based on faith and family and close connections that he simply did not enjoy with Stephen and Therese, from whom he'd had the unfortunate circumstance of being separated when they were very young, living apart from them. In 13 years, they had visited him one time for one week. He had, he had described it to Jim Logan as having lived a whole life between his first and third marriages. And the testimony from the people at the church, their neighbors, about the relationship between Kathleen and Francis, everything he did was logical, reasonable, fairly explained. He had the right, legal right to do that. And the only question is, was he coerced into doing something he didn't want to? And that's and a wonderful, wonderful argument. Uh, to make it to trial court, but how do we give you, even if we agree with you, how do we give you relief given our prohibition against uh, reweighing uh, uh, the facts or assessing uh, witness credibility? You do have, there is a question, ultimately, as a matter of law, as to whether a circumstance meets the test for suspicious circumstance. And you have to decide... Is there a reasonable inference in any of this evidence that you could say, you know, I think he may have been coerced? Now tell me why not. And you never get there. Th these circumstances are not in the least suspicious. They have to compel you well, to draw well, some Francis, reasonable Francis inference. Francis didn't call Ms. Hackett out of the clear blue. He didn't just look in the phone book and pick up somebody from Indiana. He, he got that information friend. basically from Rita to contact her, and, and, and why didn't Rita, or excuse me, Hackett, ever disclose that relationship to anyone until this litigation? Well, she disclosed it to Francis. She did not consider it a disqualification or any impairment of her ability to represent Francis, particularly when he had Kansas co-counsel. He trusted her, and frankly, when but they Kansas met, they really She never involved. disclosed that to Kansas co-counsel either. It, when did, when, when, I, when you know, it Judge be, Logan was contacted, there was never any any discussion that Hackett had a relationship with Rita, who's a beneficiary of the okay, of the I, plan. I get motive and why that happened is relevant. If the motive well, is, is it to a suspicious circumstance? Francis Press, the, the question is the suspicious circumstance. The question is, does it make you suspicion that she was able to coerce Francis Cresto into signing a will that he did not want to sign? I don't think that's a. I think that's a totally illogical inference, and I, I don't know. You can say it's a suspicious circumstance, but suspicious of what? Not suspicious of coercion. Well, she tends, she would benefit if she were successful. If everything went to her mother, and her mother okay. then gave her that, would you concede that point? She had, she had stood to receive no legal benefit. Her friend Rita would benefit. Right. So you have some emotional benefit, that, and, you, and the law does not presume that lawyers are incapable of divorcing that benefit or that that indirect possible benefit disqualifies you from drawing a will. Can we get back to the legal part of this? Uh, if we disagree uh, that the existence of suspicious circumstances is determined is a legal question, if it's a factual question, mm -hmm. if we determine that the existence of suspicious circumstances is a factual question, then I renew my question to you how do we give you what you're asking for? When we have a trial court that made uh, the factual <clears throat> determination that reasonable or uh, suspicious circumstances existed. Well, you get there by finding, as the Court of Appeals did, that the evidence is undisputed that Francis had independent counsel he and Judge Logan, and you know, if you want to experience how is half an hour long enough to ask somebody, I see you are disinheriting your children, you're leaving everything to your wife. Tell me why you want to do that. And do you want to do that? And the answer is yes, and it's a strong, competent, person stipulated to be of sound mind and testamentary capacity. He swears it in front of witnesses. I am not under coercion. His wife is with him, and she sits there and says nothing. 
Well, why, and, why isn't the Court of Appeals merely saying we disagree with the trial court's determination, assessment of credibility? It's I mean, not a credibility issue. I don't, I don't know of any reason to doubt. Well, that, that, that's, we say, that's we say what the Court the of Appeals said. The Court of Appeals said that, that uh, uh, Judge Vano found no credibility in the statements of Judge Logan that I asked him, did he understand he's cutting, cutting out his kids? And he says, yes, I do. And uh, the, Judge Vano found that wasn't credible evidence. Mm -hmm. And the Court of Appeals then says, no, Judge Vano is an experienced attorney and no experienced attorney would lie to the court. So we, we find that that is credible evidence and use that then to find there was independent counsel and there wasn't a, a problem. But they, how do we get there? How, how do we uh, reassess credibility under our rules? Okay. They also found there were no suspicious, that these circumstances didn't amount to suspicion. And I would urge you, read Ginter versus Ginter, the, oh, find out what undue influence is and what are suspicious circumstances, and this isn't it. If it is, you can't ever make a bequest to your spouse of more than their statutory share, or it's automatically suspicious and you just have all kinds of unwarranted litigation. This is not suspicious circumstances. Number two, the court cited the rules about credibility that say you have to have a reasoned basis for saying I don't believe this. You can't just say, oh, I don't, with no, no rationale, no reason why would Judge Logan lie? He's done 1,500 wills, he's been a federal judge for 20 years, he is the most honorable, most experienced probate lawyer you could find, and he has no personal motive, he has no reason to, to make that up. I mean, where do you get just saying, well, that must be a lie? And that's all Judge Vano did. And I think Judge Vano's judgment here got off into all kinds of terrible reasoning that didn't apply the law and it is substituted his own judgment for how the lawyer should have conducted themselves for what an honorable person does with his property and whether an honorable man would disinherit his children and he concluded, no, he wouldn't, I'm going to figure out how to give it to him. And, and his thought process in that decision cannot be affirmed. We get a new trial at the very least, and I think it's clear as a matter of law, no suspicious circumstances, no reason to disregard Judge Logan's testimony. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. You reserve five minutes. Sure. Uh, I believe the court is very good example of what will happen if uh, undue influence cases are allowed to be relitigated on the facts at the appellate level and the Supreme Court level. This is this is not what the appellate court process is to be for. As the appellants were doing, they're trying to relitigate the facts again at the Court of Appeals and again here in front of you. It's dangerous precedent to set forth. You you focus on the thing. We have the rulings of the trial court. Um, the Court of, Appe court of Appeals ruling basis is really keyed upon their overturning the credibility on the one question. They, they actually make another error. They say that Judge Vano did not explain why he found credibility. Now, if that's going to be the rule that every time a trial judge makes a ruling on credibility, they have to put in the record exactly why they're making this ruling on credibility. I'm making this ruling on uh, credibility, and here's my five reasons. I'm not aware that's the that's the rule for every judgment that a trial that a trial judge has to make on credibility. But even so, Judge Vano did in the record set forth, here's why I find that answer by Mr. Logan to not be credible. And that is on our supplemental brief, we cite to the record of Judge Vano's ruling on page three and four of our supplemental brief. He gave four reasons, I believe, four or five reasons as to why he found it, it in the context of everything he was hearing as a trier of fact to just not be believable. Part of it was the 
uh, uh, the brief time that uh, he's, he uh, spent with Francis Cresto, part of it was the undisclosed relationship, which is, a, is I think, standing alone a suspicious circumstance. Why did Pat Hackett not reveal her relationship to Jim Logan? Obviously, Jim Logan would have acted differently with that information. We all know he would have. It's the dog that didn't bark. It's, it's, it's a big issue, and, and he didn't know about it until after Francis Cresto was dead. I, I find your argument in, in the brief on that a, a bit misleading. Uh, when you say that he, Judge Logan admitted he would act differently, what he said he would do is would have done what he did uh, in conference in front of the witnesses. He didn't say he would have done anything differently. He just would have had more uh, audience for what he did. Uh, that's a little different in saying that he would have uh, uh, given different independent advice. Well, in in the context of the trial, it was actually a question not for me, but from Judge, but from, but from Judge Vando himself, right, as Mr. Logan was getting off the witness stand, he said, just one more question. I have to know, would you do any? And, and I think that the, the transcript said, well, just answering here off the top of my head, I would at least have spent more time with in the presence of witnesses. But I think we all know, had he known that relationship, he would have at least gotten the prior documents and done the benchmarking. And, and, and here's the other thing that I think Judge, uh, that Judge Vano found. The change in the documents was so dramatic. Kathy Cresta was already taken care of the rest of her life under the existing documents. She was already taken care of. There was a trust with a corporate trustee to provide for her the rest of her life. Our clients don't dispute that. We, we, want, we want that to be in place, that she's protected the rest of her life. The only dispute is who gets it after Kathy Cresto's death. Does it go back to Francis's uh, intended beneficiaries or to the Kaler family, including personal property, which Judge Vano found very significant because... Francis had done a lot of planning about tangible personal property, and under the revised documents, his family heirlooms went to her children, which Let, sounds Let's get odd. off the facts. You just have a short sure. time here. I, I want to know that the it, it appears to me that Judge Vano uh, cherry-picked statements from Judge Logan, <laughs> that there were some statements that he made that you know were certainly detrimental to your position, that uh, and some that were uh, helpful to your position, and he seemed to only pick out the the statements or the part of the testimony uh, that that uh, uh, favored your position. Uh, from a legal standpoint, how do we handle that? Is that um, an arbitrary disregard of of evidence, or is that just? Uh, uh, the court weighing the evidence, or, you know, it, it, it's a little troubling to me that there were statements in there that uh, would have supported that independent advice was given that the judge didn't refer to. He just cherry-picked the, the well, I, statements. I would answer, answer this way. I think that the, the substantial credible evidence standard doesn't say and there can't be any other facts out there. I think it, it, it says, even though there are facts that an appellant court may disagree with, that's not, you don't reweigh the case. You say, well, was there enough there to support the trier of fact? In almost any case, there are arguments, there are, there are other facts that the other, that the other party could hang their head on. Otherwise, it wouldn't have gone to trial. If the facts were all one-sided, this wouldn't have gone to trial. Justice, I, I know I'm out of time. I did our, on our, if, if, with the court's permission, I could I have just about one minute to talk about our, our, our uh, the uh, uh, matter of our cross uh, appeal on fees. I know I'm out of time, but I uh, can go ahead and grant one minute, but I'm going to hold you to it. Thank you, Your Honor. I, um, you know, I would remind you this is rebuttal, and he's bringing up on rebuttal something he didn't bring up before. So I won't have a chance to speak to it. That's fine. Well, are you telling us that you object to granting him time to go into something you did not have a chance to mention orally? Well, yes. Well, it's not that's proper, you know? okay. <laughs> it's just not. I, 
We'll ask you to stand on your brief then. Thank you. The court will take this matter under advisement. We thank all counsel for your arguments this morning.